Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, and I am the producer of the show, and we are thrilled to have you here with us today. Hey, we have one of our favorites with us today, a fellow Nashvillian, Audrey Assad. Audrey is the iconic artist's artist. She is one of those artists who is held in high regard here in the uh, artistic community of Nashville. She's a multiple Dove Award nominee, and uh, she is one of those artists who is always authentically putting it out there. So she's also an author, and she has recently launched a one-to-one and group coaching practice. So a lot of exciting things today. We talk about numbers. We talk about wings. We talk about uh, her one-to-one subtype. We talk about the importance of spiritual community. Uh, We cover a lot of ground today, so you're going to enjoy this conversation. So we're really glad that you're here. Hey, that's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now, without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. Audrey Assad, one to one nine, singer, songwriter, author of a great upcoming book, Doubt Becomes Wonder, uh, coach, and extraordinary human being. We're so glad you're on Typology today. Thank you for having me, Ian. Good to see you. We were just talking about your performance at the uh, Ryman. You're stealing my thunder here. Oh, am I? Well, <laughs> you bring it up. I just wanted to let her know we were talking about it beforehand. Oh, yeah, we. I remember I I saw you. I don't know if it was Token Show or what. It would have been. Yeah, it would have been. And uh, that's the only way they let me in the Ryman. <laughs> 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 only way I get in there. <laughs> well, you could buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, through the backstage door. That's the only way I get in. Right. Token Show. So. Well, we um, you played Bridge Over Troubled Water. Oh and, gosh. And I remember thinking to myself, you got about two bars in, and of course I knew right right away what it was. And I thought to myself, oh, Audrey, (laughs) oh, Audrey, because it's one of those iconic songs that you got, you got to have a lot of courage to play that song. I call it, I think you have to have a lot of ball to play that song. Yeah, exactly. I I was, (laughs) it's my eight, my eight wing is like, I got this. My nine wing is like, are you sure? You know, but I, I'm not my nine wing, my, my main type, but I, yeah. Well, I'm glad. I hope you liked it. Well, it is it is courageous move. <laughs> well, I said a little prayer for you. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, I even turned to my wife, Ann, and I was like, oh, boy, she's taking on a she is, you know, <laughs> taking on a song that that most people would say was, you know, beyond their weight class. And I and I you got about half a verse into it. And I said, damn, she's got it. She's got this. And wow, I remember and then I, I relaxed. Wow. I relaxed back into the pew <laughs> and I was I, be, I love that. Oh <laughs> yeah. I love that you took it that seriously because I take that song that seriously. I I I played that a few times at home and thought, like, do I do this? Because I, I did it on a whole tour every night with Sarah Groves one year. And I was like, it's a move, you know, because people know it so well. It's in the cultural consciousness to such a deep level that yeah, it's like. I, but you know, I'm glad that you took it that seriously. It matters a lot to me. So, well, next time I expect you to do somewhere over the rainbow. <laughs> because okay. That is equally, uh, you know, <laughs> dangerous uh, territory. You know, because All it right. was it was done right the first time. You know, and, it was and, uh, done right the first time. Yeah. So good so on true. you for courage and amazing uh, execution on it. Thank so. you so much. Wow. So every person. Uh, is a, a unique expression of their type. Uh, you are a sexual nine. You have an eight wing. Mm-hmm. And I want to know how you would describe your experience of being a nine. Okay. Well, it's evolved a fair amount as it does, I'm sure, for most people, all people. But I think the hallmark of my experience as a nine is that I attend to really um, desire harmony and holding all things in tension and unity at once. And so Mm. that is probably the hallmark of my whole life. 
Mm. And I find that in my spiritual work and in my spiritual evolution, uh, in my political activism, in my romantic relationships and friendships, I tend to be, I have a lot of mutable energy in my astrological chart, right. which can mean just a lot of both and type energy. Um, both and is kind of my life's theme, uh, I would say. And so that's, that's the main hallmark of my nine experience is mm. both and energy. Mm -hmm. Right. Which mm. of course that, uh, non-dualistic thinking is incredibly, uh, wonderful. Uh, it's a great gift. Uh, nines have no problem with paradox. Uh, nope. In fact, paradox. I love it. it feeds me <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Like paradox is something to swim in, you know. Yeah. You know, whereas ones, uh, eights, mm. uh, tend to be, you know, more black and white thinkers. More things are either mm. black and white, right or wrong, you know, etc. And, and of course, actually, though they don't believe it, that too can be a gift, right? Because absolutely for the nine, sometimes they never land. Right. Right. It's... My my literary agent told me my whole brand is change. I'm <laughs> always I'm always just I'm like where's my next like Eddie in the river? But I right. I don't I don't land very often or very long on mm. anything. Um, I well my eight wing sort of grounds me into some more like um, fixed points of reference, but which I'm grateful for. I'm so grateful that nines are winged by eight and one. Mm -hmm. because it is such a helpful balance to my uh, melty, you know, I want to merge with everyone and everything sometimes. And, um, and that is a gift, but I do need, I need grounding. I need salt. I need rocks and grass and things that are you know, like physical and real. And so. yeah, because some things are right or wrong. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, sure. like both and doesn't work with racism. Right. right. Both and doesn't work with, right a lot of things mm -hmm. and and right. so you know to have right. the ability to see all perspectives sometimes totally. eh, doesn't really totally. i mean you know what i think the gift of it is is not about ideas but about people mm. uh that i can both hold that an idea is flawed or damaging or what have you and be able to contextualize the human being holding the idea um, as a person with a very fragmented psyche, like everyone else, and sort of seeking to understand the particular ways in which they arrived at these conclusions. Like right. that's where that energy comes in, in a healed way for me. Now, when I'm in like a, mm -hmm. when I've been in the less healed or whole state or moment to moment, when I'm fluctuating up and down the sort of normal ladder of health that goes throughout our day or function or whatever, um, you know, I can tend to be a people pleaser or like a yeah bypasser in those ways. And so it is something to look out for mm. operating in it as a gift and not a, a, an escape. Yeah. And so you just used a very important word bypasser, or we talk often though, not on the show. So that's why I want to ask you what you mean by that, because, uh, spiritual bypassing is a very mm -hmm. important, uh, idea in the spiritual life. Right. Um, can you just tell people what you mean by being a yeah. bypasser? Yeah, absolutely. So I've seen it crop up a lot for me in both my kind of Christian experience, which is the context from which I've arrived at adulthood. And then my kind of foray into what I guess some people would call new age spirituality, for lack of a better term, but kind of like engaging with these more, um, all this work on like the ego and the self and the all this kind of stuff, Jung, Ram Dass, all of the above. Um, in both worlds and in all worlds, there's a there's a potential that we can kind of uh, sometimes manifest to go like, well, I practice acceptance of all that is. And in doing that, I ignore or dismiss or bypass the very real social ills that I see because I just accept that they're here. And I accept that you believe what you believe. And so you get to be you and I get to be me. And, you know, that's one form and that's kind of in the new age camp, it tends to be a little bit more easy and tempting to accept all like the way Carl Jung talks about accept all reject none. But the thing is, when you practice real acceptance of what is here, it, it also means the conflict and the divisions and the fragmented psyche and the things that are, you know, like, I'm thinking of a friend of mine who's an Enneagram eight and on Twitter, she is just like, 
false to the law all the time about social justice. And some people really find that irritating, but I'm sort of like, we need people like that. Like we need people who aren't just sitting around like accepting that things are wrong. Um, we need people who will storm the gates. Like that's part of all, that's part of accepting all. And in my Christian experience, it would be more like, well, God has a plan. God mm. has a reason for what you're going through. So it's another form of the same acceptance. Well, something must be, there must be some reason why you lost your child. Like lean on the fact that God's understanding is higher than yours and bypass the grief and the confusion and the anger that you're feeling because those things are bad feelings. You know, that's mm. another form of spiritual bypassing that masquerades itself as acceptance. Yes. Yes. Hey, everybody. One of the lessons I've learned over the years is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50-minute counseling session. And this is why some people can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for a long time and never really get anywhere. This is why I'm such a believer of intensive counseling and my friends at Restoring the Soul in Colorado, created by my longtime friend Michael Cusick to help couples or individuals experience deep change and have day blocks over one or two weeks. Now listen, if you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough, you need to get in touch with my friend Michael and his extraordinary team of counselors at Restoring the Soul. If you're looking to get out of the rut you're in but can't wait months or years, call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation with Michael's staff. Call 303-932-9777 and learn how their intensive counseling process can help you as a special bonus just for typology listeners make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com slash typology to download their pdf called five ways unaddressed trauma may be derailing your relationships you know i i oftentimes uh will say when i meet uh, someone who's what i would call theologically rigid or right um yeah, that they are spiritually bypassing doing their own shadow work. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's oh, like, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, you have managed to take your spirituality and fit it into a particular construct that, uh, you know, assuages your anxiety mm. about mm -hmm. the, the unpredictability of the world and the, yes. uh, you know, about the mystery and just inherent in, in all uh, faiths, you know, and it's like, well, you know, you're bypassing your anxiety uh, and yeah. living with it. Right. And I think yeah. for every single type on the Enneagram, there is a particular kind of spiritual bypassing that they might sure. have a tendency to gravitate toward. And so maybe we'll do a show on that sometime in the future, like Love how to that. avoid spiritual bypassing for each type. For the different mm, numbers. Good. I think that's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. So I want to talk just for a minute about sexual nines because we uh, here at Typology really focus on subtypes. Um, a, okay. lot of, a lot of teachers don't, and I think it's a big mistake. There really are 27 mm. types. It's good to start with nine. If mm -hmm. you if you go further on the journey, you really can't avoid the 27 subtype, you know, the, the whole the subtype uh, world. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, one to one nines are kind of the ninest of the nines. Um, they that are, resonates. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, and so when, when you go to a workshop on the Enneagram or you listen to a podcast and someone describes a one to one nine. It really just sounds like the nine you hear about in books and everywhere else versus the uh, the the social and self present nines, which present very differently, really mm. differently. And so um, let's just talk for a minute for people who are new to subtypes about the unique uh, kind of hue of the of the of the sexual nine. Can you can you speak to that uh, a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm actually relatively new to the subtype uh, conversation as well. It was actually about, I want to say five months ago that I had that kind of finally landing on what I felt. I mean, it took me years, which mm -hmm. is probably pretty nine of me. I was like, I see myself in all these things. I feel mm -hmm. like I am yes. this way sometimes and I'm this way other times. And I, 
And it really wasn't until I actually encountered a pretty brash eight um, that I wasn't, I was a new person in my life. And, and he said, I'm going to, I'm going to censor the profanity. But he said, um, this is how, you know, if you're a sexual type, he said, sexual nines walk into a room and they immediately know how much every person in that room wants to F them. <laughs> and he said, but what I really, it isn't really about sex. It's about really being able to walk into a room and kind of um, sense the energy and decide, I know exactly who and with what I want to be interacting here and then zoom in and really go deep with that person. That's one example maybe of how it might manifest. And I am absolutely that person in a lot of ways, you know, going to a party or a wedding and like looking for my people. And I, I have a, I've even used dating apps that way. I've been on dating apps and I've been like, who are like my people, the energies that I know I can resonate with. I can sense who they are. And even if we wouldn't connect romantically, I like know you would be my friend. I know. And I've never been wrong. Not once. Wow. It's so interesting. So I think I have a certain, that's for me how it manifests the most is this ability to um, read a person's spiritual energy and know how I would interact with it and whether or not I'd like to. That's kind mm -hmm. of, um, a way that I feel like I experienced that. Yeah. And you're, you're really describing the, uh, the, the dominant instinct there, um, of the, of the nine, which is when they, if they walk into a room as you, just to use your example, the, the big fear they have would be, uh, that, or there, maybe I would say their attention goes toward desirability. Am I desirable? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, the, the sexual nine is the least assertive of all the nines. <laughs> okay. That's interesting uh, because I will say that is not how I present socially, but I think that could be my eight wing. Mm -hmm. But because I tend to be actually pretty, pretty confident and maybe not assertive though. I guess I don't, maybe I'm not really assertive when I think about it and say it out loud. I'm like, I'm a deeply confident person but I do tend to like let other people take the lead because yeah, I'm like, right. I'm cool. I don't need to do that. Right. But I can, I, I know I can. And sometimes I pick my moment and I'm like in there. Right. But to use a phrase I often use maybe for you, as opposed to a three, seven or eight to take the lead requires that you burn more calories. Yeah. That makes right? sense. Whereas mm -hmm. an eight actually gets calories from right. a three does a seven does, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a four, I'm in, I'm a withdrawing, uh, type. And so like a five and a nine four, five mm -hmm. and nines. And, uh, so I can lead, but I'm very happy not to, I, yeah, you know, I can, similar. yeah. I mean, I have a pretty strong three wing, which, which, you know, I can yeah. lean into at the moment, but you know, yeah. it's, not my, it's not my, that makes so much sense. Mind. And something I really like about myself is that I love seeing other people win. I, like I get so much actual satisfaction out of watching someone operating in their gift. And I rarely, I do have my own just jealousies and insecurities as a person because I'm human. But one thing I don't really wrestle with is watching someone else and be like, I wish I was up there right now. I'm like, mm. oh. like I love watching someone um, thriving and succeeding. And my jealousies really are around the desirability issue um when not about see, seeing when, success right right so when mm. you see others who are uh, appear to be more desirable than you it it would you know uh, elicit those kinds of feelings like like sexual types tend to be definitely more jealous than the other two subjects that's interesting but particularly when it comes to a romantic partner or an hmm. intimate friend, like hmm. for example, if uh, maybe as a little kid, you felt this way, but if you, if you had said to a, a, a friend as a little kid, Hey, let's play today. And mm -hmm. then you get to their house and there's another kid there. Interesting. It, who you might even like, right. But you mm -hmm. wanted that special time with your friend, just the two of you. And That's so, so interesting. I've never really characterized that as jealousy, but I see how it is. Huh. You're jealous of the, of the time, right? Uh, or that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so even with a partner, a partner might say, 
uh, you might feel like a partner is spending too much time at work or too much time volunteering, and it's mm. really taking away from time in the relationship. And you could mm. even become jealous of the work they're doing. You know, it's, what's interesting is I'm I'm sitting with my reaction to that. And I actually do, it, it resonates a lot with me five years ago. Mm. There are ways in which I think through shadow work, I've actually begun to transform and transmute that in myself. Because I will say that five years ago, I think that was like hyper true of me. And now I've kind of come to a spot where I'm starting to experience more um, change in that area. Yes. And but that would definitely be where I started. Yeah. And we're going to circle back to Carl Jung because I know that Jung has become a really important uh, influence in your life. But yeah. just to throw it into his language, it sounds like you have experienced a great deal of individuation in the last yes. few years. And so I have. that would explain mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. how uh, the nine who typically merges and for a sexual nine, it would be merges with another individual. Right. Versus a social nine who will merge with the agenda of the group. Okay. Versus mm -hmm. another person. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so because the, the sexual nine tends to merge in order to glean a sense of identity from the other. Yes. Now I'm yeah. describing, I'm describing an unevolved nine here. So I'm not sure, necessarily sure, sure. describing you. Yeah. Um, but my shadow still exists, you know? <laughs> so totally right? inside me. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and so they they have trouble when they're not very conscious, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, um, they they tend to uh, how do I want to say this? They, they become blurry. Mm -hmm. They they uh, they 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 start to blur the line between where they end and where the other begins. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. just it's this. That's so Funny. Yeah, for those, you, for, you, yeah. Well, for those of you who are watching, it's more this. Mm -hmm. And then as you get healthy, it becomes this. Mm -hmm. Where did you just go when you? Oh, I'm just recalling a song I wrote in 2008. And the first line of it was, where do I begin? Where do I end and where do you begin? Mm. We're tangled up together. Uh our limbs are intertwined. It goes on this whole illustration about like two trees sort of twining together. And that for me was what it felt like to love someone then mm. just like two root systems completely intertangling. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, Oh, that's entanglement. <laughs> exactly. But that's, that's consciousness coming into play, right? Like for yeah. young. And again, I don't want to get too academic with folks, but this is a, a pretty easy concept that I think everyone would get, which is, Sorry for repeating myself, Anthony. It's like what, how to make the unconscious conscious. Yes, and so yes. when, when you know now you have made uh, and stopped uh, idealizing or making a virtue of enmeshment, mm -hmm. and and now it's like <laughs> you know the the great paradox is, and Nines will love this, is that the more you become yourself separate from others the greater the probability that you will actually come into real relationship. Yeah. Which is why the I'm Enneagram experiencing is, that. I'm experiencing yeah, that. I was just Go thinking on. that's, well, that's just why the Enneagram is such a helpful tool because what you did uh, pursue, you know, as a goal, you realize now is your shadow. Exactly. Yeah. And I thank it. I thank it and I accept it because mm. there's no other place to begin than the beginning. And, yeah. um, the void is important and, and we all, uh, it's we all the birthplace of all things. So, yes. And I was going to say, we all do that. I mean, we all need these tools to help us because we, we don't even know we're in our shadow. It's like Jung says, right? He who looks inside awakes. Yeah. Well, I kind of love him. I wish he were here. He is here in our unconscious right now. That's um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm going to use a phrase that uh, some people understand, but I, I don't want it to be understood in this context. You know, you know, people have probably many people have read, though I haven't, the five love languages, right? And so mm -hmm. let's talk about. I think there are nine love languages. Okay. Right, and I'm just curious if you had to, in brief, talk about what is the love language for you as a sexual nine? What is it? Or a one to one nine? Sorry, that's the different mm -hmm. term. Well, that's interesting because I have my own, I certainly have my own thoughts and feelings about that whole idea. 
because I believe that every human's first and primary love language is touch, whether or not they feel that way. Mm. I, I could be wrong, but based on my studies of attachment theory and kind of, um, the, the way that a body and a, a person becomes mirrored and their identity as a self develops a huge part of that is um, being touched in appropriate safe ways. And a lot of the fragmentation around relationships to touch develops really early, but I don't think it means that it's not a primary love language for all people, but that's, that's the way I see that. But putting that aside for a second, um, my primary love language is physical touch. Uh, mm -hmm. My second would probably be words of affirmation. I, I tend to be very effusive with people I love physically and verbally. Um, very, maybe too much. <laughs> like a two, so, like a two. Uh, yeah. My wife is a nine. My daughter's a nine. And um, both of them are very tactile people. Um some teachers would disagree with me. I think part of that is that you're in the body uh, mm -hmm. triad. And so, yeah. you know, I think, you know, when I meet self press fives, that that is not a first line, you know, it, it's mm, right. They got to work. On I know it. a couple of those. Yeah. You know, I know some yeah. ones who really have to work on it. Twos are very tactile. Uh, I know mm -hmm. some threes who would be a little bit more, uh, you know, and of course, trauma has a lot. To yeah. Do, right. You know, there are a lot to do with personality in general. You it know? does. It does. And this is where the Enneagram does help, because I know when I'm with a five, particularly one that hasn't done any work. And this has happened to me in corporate settings and other places where mm -hmm. I just know I got to stand back another foot than I do mm -hmm. away from them than I do with a five, with a two. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. twos want to hug you out the gate, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Sometimes in a way that's uncomfortable for me, you, you know, it, because it can feel right. like engulfment. Yeah. yeah, I hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, which is, you know, or, or what James Hollis would call overwhelmment. Mm. Right? And I can kind of go, oh, I feel like you're getting a little yeah. histrionic and overwhelming for me. Totally. Um, totally. And one of the one of the great things about, I think, my subtype. What, one of the ways I, one of the things I like about it is that I do actually try to read the room or the person. My instinct is to be like, how are you hand on the shoulder? I, I would touch people. I mean, like not in inappropriate ways, but I'm like, if you let me and you feel good about it, like I will snuggle my friends on the, I love cuddling people. I'm just like so tactile, but I don't, I do not force that on anyone because I can read if that's a, like something someone wants um, and I ask, like, if I don't know them, I'm like, can I put a hand on your shoulder? Yes. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a desire to put a hand on your shoulder while you're talking to me about this very hard thing. Can I do that? And if it's okay, if not, but like, it is my instinct for sure. And, you know, I've never met a person who was offended when I said to them, do you mind if I hug you? Mm -hmm. You know, totally. It, it's, totally. I, it, you know, it's never, it's like with, it's like when someone says to me, you know, uh, I've never been offended when, when, uh, a, a younger person or anyone has said to me you know, called me, sir. I, you know what I mean? It's sort of like <laughs> that never, that never offended me, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and it, it's never, yeah. I don't know anyone who's, and I've had people say to me, I'm not a touching type of person. Yeah. You know? and, and I I'm love like, when someone can do that. Yes. Yeah. Oh and I gosh. think when you know the Enneagram, you, you start to learn how to ask questions like that. Good, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know? love that. Yeah. yeah. Anthony, what if I told you you could get high quality, organic, and non-GMO groceries delivered to your door for a lot less than you're paying now and help out families in need. No. Mm -hmm. Really? Let me tell you, that's what I'm doing since I discovered Thrive Market. As a proud Thrive Market member, I get the products I love and my paid membership provides a free membership for one low-income family. Oh, now I like this. Mm -hmm, right? And let me tell you this. Okay. I've ordered off their website, which, by the way, is very user-friendly. It's not at all like, you know, like one of those websites where you feel like you just fell into some kind of terrible labyrinth. They have the 
the best selection of high quality, healthy, and sustainable products online. A couple of things I love. Mm -hmm. They have Jackson's Honest Sweet Potato Chips. Have you ever jammed on those before? I have not. Well, you're welcome. All right. Mm -hmm. Jackson's Honest Sweet Potato Chips I got at Thrive Market. And yes, I used to be a Goline cereal guy. Remember that? I know this, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm so healthy. But now I eat organic coconut flakes cereal from Thrive Market. Ooh, I can't wait to try that. It is changing my whole life as a special offer for Typology listeners. Join Thrive Market today to get 25% off your first order and an exclusive free gift. Mm. The only way to get this offer is by going to thrivemarket.com slash typology. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com forward slash T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y to get the exclusive offer of 25% off your first order and yes. a free gift. Nice. Mm -hmm. You can't get this offer anywhere else. Go to thrivemarket.com slash typology. All right. So I want to talk about spiritual crisis and deconstruction. And I want to talk, oh. I want to, I will want to talk about it through the lens of the Enneagram, uh, okay. not, not just, you know, in general, but mm -hmm. about, I know that you've been on a journey of, of spiritual deconstruction. You, you come out of a, uh, I think if I had said to you five years ago, how you would self-identify spiritually, you, you'd mm -hmm. have said uh, a Catholic Christian, right? Yeah. In a serious yeah. one, a serious one. Right. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. and I'm just wondering, I know you've been on this path. Um, tell me about it. And uh, again, through the, sure. through the lens of a nine. OK, so I came from before Catholicism, I came from a very, very, very fundamentalist evangelical background. And in that world, I struggled because it was very rigid, hyper rigid. And I had a very real um piece of myself that really, really obviously wanted to belong, wanted to escape hell, wanted to continue to have a community life. And we were a shunning community. We were very sort of um, binary and insulated from the world. We didn't vote. We didn't marry outside. We didn't get into business with people outside our denomination. It was like 60 people at our church. We lived our whole lives almost entirely together outside of, you know, the work and school day. And so but I struggled because I'm a nine. <laughs> so I would hear these things and things people would say about whatever it would be like homosexuality or about politics or, and I'd go like, I can't, this is, I'm so pulled like in different directions by my desire to merge and belong and feel accepted and approved of and desired. And I cannot understand how you can draw these lines. Hmm. And so the perfect way I feel like a good illustration of this is when I was eight or nine years old, Bill Clinton was elected president. And I vividly remember the election because I, my, you know, there was Rush Limbaugh playing in my house talking about the end times. And like, everybody was like, Bill Clinton is the antichrist. Cause we're always looking for that outside instead of in. And I was so scared of all of that. I had so much stress running through my body but in my school election, I voted for him both times that they did a poll. And I dealt with so much shame and stress about what, what I was hearing was going on and my own instincts toward a different way of thinking that when the election night rolled around, I remember that I had cold sores rimming my whole mouth. Mm. Like I probably had 12 of them from stress, from the stress of feeling pulled in two directions and not knowing how to like process um, my instincts versus the group versus the, what the standard for belonging and acceptance was. And so my deconstruction started in, in earnest in um, the spring of 2015. And I remember I wrote a, an email to um, a friend who is an agnostic, which is kind of in between agnostic and atheist for lack of a better, easier way to describe it. Um, former Christian music industry professional. And I wrote him an email and I was like, I don't know what to do. Um, I've allowed myself to ask all the questions that I had. And my biggest question started as what if nobody's coming? What if nobody's coming? 
And I was like, I don't think anyone is coming. I think everything that's coming is already here or something. Like I was starting to really get into touch with like the, the, the idea of the unconscious collective and sort of like, and it appealed to me and like terrified the shit out of me because I was like, well, if that's it, like if everything my life has been built on isn't, is kind of a projection of a wounded collective psyche, basically. Um, I've got to like, I got to redo everything. Like, it sounds exhausting. I just remember being like, I can't, I'm tired. I'm a new mom. Like what? But I couldn't let it alone, you know, it just was happening. And so I will say it was fast. It was fast. I was pretty tormented for about a year, but I was like, nope, burn it all down. Like we're done. And, um, but, but then I was faced with the very difficult piece of having a public life as a person who was a very public Christian at the time, a Catholic, I guess, technically I'm still Catholic. I was baptized Catholic. Um, and so now I've been living in this weird liminal space of like, how do I be forthcoming about this evolution while still being the both end person that I am? Because I don't want to burn bridges. Mm. I actually, I want to invite people into wholeness in any way I can, which sometimes requires burning down structures, but a lot of, I don't want to burn down bridges. I want to burn structures down. And so my eight wing is like, yes, take the torch to the thing. My nine wing is like, keep the bridges open, you know, so yep. people can come across. And so I'm, I'm kind of in that stage now where I'm just like reckoning with the shift. And I've been a lot more forthcoming on my socials and such about the evolution I've been going through. And um, yeah, it's, it was a tough thing to be a both and person in a fundamentalist background. Mm. Very, very tormenting. I experienced a lot of stress from that. And, and, you know, I'm glad you mentioned nine with eight because people say to me sometimes, I think subtypes are more important than wings. However, and I actually know spiritual directors and Enneagram teachers who will ignore wings altogether. Okay. Because yeah, they would say, I don't know. I, you know, it's, there, it's, it's <laughs> interesting, but I'm not really into it. Um, and so I, the reason I like them is because they explain so many of the contradictions within a type. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and so, for example, a four with, with uh, a three wing would be a good example. Uh, a nine with an eight wing would be a good example. So, you know, there's more contradictions in a nine with an eight wing than a nine with a one wing. I've heard that. Right. I've and, heard I'm a rare sort. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, you know, we, we all of us are a bundle of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And, and right. I, again, I think this is a, a blessing of the Enneagram is it helps begin to help you at least at one level begin to go oh there's the source mm -hmm. of the contradiction yes mm -hmm. you know and why i've never mm -hmm. really understood these two things in my own life right yeah that seem mutually uh contradict contradictory right um so i i just a couple of things came to my mind as you were talking i i'm laughing about the bill clinton thing because a <laughs> lot of people will say he's a three and i am absolutely convinced he's a nine interesting absolutely convinced and and i know other teachers who are too uh and and so i'm it's just so funny to me that that even i have no yeah. idea if it has anything to do with it but but you know maybe you felt some degree maybe. of simpatico you know i may have i remember feeling that way wow i mean i felt so, a, i felt a, a spiritual resonance with him and i couldn't figure out why at the time that's hmm. for sure so Let's talk a little bit too about deconstruction. And, and, and so for, for folks who are listening, what, what we're really talking about here is, you know, uh, beginning to interrogate our spiritual um, identity, uh, convictions, um, mm -hmm. theology, if that's a word for us. I mean, you know, it's, it's actually the, the ability to step back from what we've been doing our whole life or for a long time and beginning to challenge or allow challenges to come to the fore without anxiety or with anxiety, but still, with it, yeah, but, allowing. And, but able to endure it. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so one of the ways I would, would maybe frame it out is all of us start with a thesis in life, right? And, mm -hmm. and so think about, you know, Christianity as a thesis, and then in deconstruction, what happens is you move to antithesis, mm -hmm. right? Or anti-thesis, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you can become very hostile toward the yeah. world from which you came. And then I think where the 
maybe the journey of deconstruction comes to a healthy conclusion because I, I see a lot of people who just spend all their lives in Absolutely. antithesis in and antithesis. it's so unhealthy. They just they just become bitter, angry whiners, complainers for the rest of their life about mm-hmm. the world they came out of without ever sure. moving on to which I to the to the place of what I would call synthesis. Mm. I love that. And and so and, and I think we we I've done it uh and I think everybody who's healthy does it many times in their life. Many times. Ah, absolutely. And not just about, is a process. Yeah. And not just in the spiritual life, but in the relationship life, in my marriage, yeah. uh, in my friendships, in everything. There, I begin with a thesis. At some point, I go to antithesis, and then I move towards synthesis. Mm, I love that so much. It's very nine. <laughs> it is very nine. And it's, oh, very, man. it's very four. Yeah, I can see that too. It's very, very for uh, as well. Hey, Typology Tribe. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for helping us bring you what I hope is great content every week. Now, you all know I'm a big proponent of counseling. Whether you feel like something is interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving certain goals, counseling is a great tool to help identify what those blocks are and then work through them. Yet finding a therapist can sometimes feel intimidating, but not with BetterHelp. BetterHelp offers online counseling at your own time and your own pace. You can schedule secure video or phone sessions plus text and chat with your therapist when it's convenient for you. These are licensed professional counselors who specialize in things like depression, anxiety, stress, relationships, LGBT matters, trauma, and grief. BetterHelp has counselors available worldwide and have over 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. And get this, if you're not satisfied with your counselor for any reason, you can request a new one at any time at no additional cost. Best of all, it's a truly affordable option. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash typology podcast. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash typology podcast t-y-p-o-l-o-g-y p-o-d-c-a-s-t all right so um let me just ask you a couple of questions more i know that you're a a coach now uh, and that's sort of a new thing that that you're doing glad you're doing it have you used the enneagram in your coaching I have not. Um, I have actually yet to launch the one-to-one portion of it. So it's starting mm. in January. Um, I, like most things in my life, I what I do is chew the cud for an impossibly long stretch of time. And then I get the, I get the ping or the gut feeling or the, the alignment, the higher self, and I know it's time to do it. And I just go. Mm. And so this is similar, you know, I've been tossing around just like idea after idea in my mind. Uh, part, part of that is my temperament, perhaps the Enneagram, just examining, 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 like circling, 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 circling. And I also live with OCD. Um, and the type of OCD I live with involves excessive ideation. <laughs> so it's just like, and then one day I just know, and I'm in my body and I know. And so the other day I was like a few weeks ago, a month ago, it was like the name came, that's the name of my book, Doubt Becomes Wonder. And I was like, that's the coaching practice is how to midwife people through mm. the transition mm. of losing, whether intentionally or unintentionally, the foundation or the structures of um, their belief system. And ideally midwifing them to synthesis because Mm. I think community plays a huge role in that. When we swing, which we're inevitably going to do 
Um, one thing that can be a, a medicine in that uh, process is people accepting, loving, encouraging, challenging, coming around us to um, contextualize our our story. And so that became my desire. It was like, I'd like to create a spiritual community that lives online because we're in COVID 2020, right? Uh, but that also involves this one-to-one coaching practice. One-to-one, my favorite thing. It um, is. I was about to laugh yeah. about that. One-to-one. You keep one. being That's what a one-to-one-nine. One yeah, one to one I'm like, my dream. Yeah. And I, I just, I want to, because a midwife or a doula is a person who is ultimately, they're really just there to remind you what your body already knows how to do. Mm-hmm. And to remind you that you have what it takes, even when it feels like you don't. and that everything about the process is sacred and important and a piece of the whole. And so to me, that's kind of the visual image I have for my coaching practices, midwife mm. people through the transition into the birth and through into like, hopefully um, a happy, healthy place of wholeness in this one department. Um, and I don't think I can do that for people. I think people can do that for themselves. And I'm just there to remind them that they can, you know, and uh, maybe help them discover the ways, the how of it for themselves based on their temperament and their situation. Mm. So that's kind of what I launched. Yeah. You know, it's really great because um, nines, integrated nines make really great therapists, really great coaches, uh, really great spiritual directors. They can really, uh, they know how to come alongside people um, because they, uh, and they're okay living in, in that gray zone with people. Mm-hmm. They, uh, when they're healthy, they, they, they manifest what, what, you know, I learned in grad school is a, a non-anxious presence. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they, they can be with somebody in pain with, and be without anxiety with them. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and so, reckon, yes. yeah, they become the anchor, uh, for that person, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, because you radiate peace, you know, mm-hmm. and and that makes a person feel like, you know, without your needing to say it, you know, it's, it's going to be all right, you know, mm-hmm. all all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well, mm-hmm. which, which is a great mantra for nines, you know, that's a it gift. Is. They have. Julian of Norwich, yep. Norwich, or however you say it. Mm-hmm. I I often have an image um, in my mind, and I actually have to do a fair amount of energetic work on myself to because I do merge but I do merge in a non-anxious way nowadays more than an anxious way. And what I vision, envision when I'm with someone, cause I do, I do some like, um, I don't know what you would call it. I, I, I don't have any training, but for friends, I, you know, do like massage with energy reading. I just have certain intuitive abilities in that department and have sat with people who are struggling and suffering. And I'll envision myself like a sieve like I'm, I'm hovering above them here and slightly interacting with their border, but I have holes so I can let it flow out through me versus like sitting in my own, like, I don't want to absorb it and take it on. I think transference is a real thing, uh, both psychologically and spiritually. And so I try to envision myself as like a, I'm floating in the ocean, but I'm full of holes. So like, it's all just kind of flowing out through and leaving and being transmuted into love, hopefully and healing. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> I do love to sit with people Mm. in all kinds of states. You're in the, you're you're in the right gig then. I I think (laughs) that, that for nines, it's uh, really a a natural space, but, but I think for sure they have to be, have done the work of individuation. Otherwise Mm -hmm. they're they're gonna, they're gonna merge with, with that other person in a really. And I have done that. Mm -hmm. I have done that. And it is painful. It is painful stuff. So I, I mean, I'm sure that I'll always live with a certain degree of predilection toward that, but I do feel like I'm relatively aware mm. of the tendency, which is all it really takes is consciousness. You know, mm. you can stop and pause and get a look at yourself and readjust. That's what I was going to ask, Audrey, for our, you know, nine listeners. Uh, what are a few tips for mm-hmm. you <laughs> that, that, have, that tell you, oh, I'm merging or I have merged? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Well, you know, I think there's a lot, there's a lot floating around out there. Let's say just on Instagram in particular in the pop psychology world about Enneagram, about 
empathy and empathic people about narcissism and all these different kinds of they've become almost buzzwords like these mm. big ideas that are often really misunderstood by the simplicity with which they're presented mm. and one thing i think that gets talked about a lot is empathy understandably we all need that it's a it's a skill and a, a gift that a lot of people struggle to embody or receive in their lives and i i totally you know like believe in empathy and i believe in emphasizing but what you said earlier was that like sometimes a virtue gets made out of enmeshment mm. and gets called empathy. I feel your feelings with you mm -hmm. can be actually a really like not great place to be sitting to the degree that it goes. Mm. Cause I have definitely been sort of taken down almost by people who are, they're not intending Hmm. you know, to take me down with them. I'm, I'm the one being taken down with. Right. So like, I'm the one who's sort of like, I'm not anchoring. I'm just, I'm a barnacle and I'm going down, you know, like on the submarine. And it's like, that is, that is within my control. Hmm. And so the only tip I can give is, is an annoying one because it's comprehensive and a large amount of work, but is shadow work um, is, is seeking out a daily practice or two or 10 of, of how to like discover the, the sort of um, fragments in my own psyche and, and accept them and integrate them and start to become conscious. I don't really think there's, I don't think I have 10 practical steps. Um, that would be way too one for me. I'm like, <laughs> you gotta find your own path. But I do think, I think uh, what I can say is that I do try to be really conscious of noticing if I'm feeling the empathy or the feeling of someone else's feelings transforming into cortisol in my system. Mm. And I can notice that through a heart rate elevation. Uh, I can notice that through a sense of like tightness in my chest and in my throat, mm. bodily somatic experiences of stress. If I'm starting to exhibit that in an interaction, I've mm. learned to recuse myself or excuse myself for a moment to collect and go like, what am I, where are my boundaries dissolving? That's good. Um, I often find visualization really helpful as well. And so maybe this is because I'm a body type. I just, mm. I do sort of, when I'm feeling that feeling in an inter interaction or confrontation, let's say, I start to really imagine my skin becoming a little thicker, <laughs> mm. like, envisioning a border around myself because mm. that is where I struggle, right? To like feel like I have a border or a boundary or a self. And I, I try to like, have you ever seen the show Alex Mack from the nineties? No. Um, mm -mm. So there was this show with um, her name was Alyssa. Oh gosh. I can't remember. Or Larissa. She was from 10 things I hate about you. Larissa, somebody anyways, she would, she had this ability to uh, melt into this kind of silver puddle and like, go under things and trans come back into a body. And so I actually always was like, I, I feel that way. I feel like I can melt myself into like, I just amorphous blob, you know, and there, I just try to envision myself being like in my body and embodied and with borders and boundaries. And sometimes when I feel like I'm merging, visualizing the physical change is really helpful to me. Um, so those are some things that I do. That's good. But, it is yeah. good. It is really good. And, and uh, we should do a show on somatic work because yeah. uh, when, when I'm teaching workshops, um, one of the things I do is, is encourage people to do somatic work. Where does your passion live in your body? Uh, how do you know when envy or sloth or lust is beginning to take the wheel? And, and mm. you know, for me, I, I know exactly where envy lives in my body. It's right here in, in my at the base of my neck and the nape of my neck. And I know that when I feel my throat constricting and I feel this kind of weight mm. around this place in my body, it's like that is a red flag for me. Mm -hmm. And it's like I just start to pay attention to it. And, mm -hmm. and I bring my Good. attention to it and begin to say, what's happening right now? Yeah. What, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to tell me? And and so that's really great. And I want to uh, remind people that, you know, shadow work, I'm going to have to give this in a very short, simplistic uh, <laughs> sentence or two, but, but shadow work, you know, Carl Jung would say that all of us have a shadow and yeah. the shadow is the place that we unconsciously put parts of ourselves of uh, who we are uh, out of view 
because we, we don't want to own it. In fact, sometimes we want to disavow it. We, we don't, right. it's inconsistent with our self-image or it, it, it's a piece of who we are that we had to give up in childhood because it wasn't compatible with our culture, what our culture or our family of origin wanted from us. Right. Uh, and so, and it's also where a lot of those, there are things that belong in the shadow, right. And should stay there. Like, our animal murderous instinct, perhaps, you know, it's sure. like that has to be acknowledged as being in the shadow. However, we should want it to be um, managed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't want to indulge that. But we we do want to. Um, and, and by the way, the Enneagram is shadow work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And people don't want to hear that. They want strengths finder. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. you know, what, what the Enneagram and people oftentimes say to me, gosh, this thing just feels so negative in the beginning. Yeah. I'm like you're darn it right. <laughs> yeah. I don't make any apologies for it. It's like yeah. when it's know, used properly, when it's used properly, the yeah. Enneagram isn't, Oh, I'm a six. And this mm -hmm. is what this is, what this is. It's like, no, you have only begun, you know, it's like, yeah. You know, as a two, you need to realize that um, it's not that you're just loving or, you know, a little codependent sometimes. It's like, nope, you're calculating and manipulative. Mm -hmm. You use you use flattery as a way of drawing, of seducing people into the web of your world. And mm. you want to create people who are dependent on you. And you know what I mean? It's like, wow, this, yes, this is material yes. in the shadow. Yes. Right. You know, for yes. a nine, for a nine, part of the shadow work uh, would be recognizing that you're being nice, quote unquote, mm -hmm. or or mm -hmm. kind of being easygoing or don't rock mm -hmm. the boat, blah, 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 is a selfish deal. Yeah. You know, because yes. you actually don't want life to get to you. And, yep. and so you have to do the shadow work of realizing that just being nice is a way of of mm -hmm. actually uh, ab abdicating the throne of your own yep. personal authority. Yep. And, and it's also, uh, keeping people very much at bay, mm -hmm. even though we want, you know, there's the merging thing, but it's almost like, I want to connect with you by this weird, like sideways, mm -hmm. like, you know, energetically merging with you while not really reckoning with the things you're telling me without having to show up to myself. Saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, mm, I'm going to, I'm going to steal your identity. Yeah. Mm, right. In, in order to vampiric. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 <laughs> it very much. That's a great word. It is. Now nines, mm. you're uncomfortable right now because you always <laughs> will be when you do shadow work. Mm. Yeah. That's and, the part. That's where, you know, it's working. Mm -hmm. it's yes. Out. And, and this is another Jungian idea. Very important is the golden shadow. So there are parts of your shadow mm -hmm. that where you have, um, for reasons of survival, maintaining relationships with important people in your life, you know, you, you know, for example, you might have been a child who was very, very creative, uh, very musical. But what if the message from your family was, you know, oh, music? Oh, that's, you know, lower passions. And, you know, if you were a real Christian, you know, be very mm. careful of the creative, imaginative world. You're a sinful person. Right. And right, show right. business, show business is a bad thing. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you had to relegate that into the golden shadow. Mm. And so part of the journey of doing shadow work isn't just the negative thing. It's also bringing, bringing back yes. all the beautiful pieces yes. of you that were lost and yes. forgotten in yes. it as a yes. little person. Mm -hmm. So, okay, mm -hmm. I want I got to finish up. I I want you to tell okay. everybody what you're doing and where they can find out about it. Okay, well, I'm working on a book called Doubt Becomes Wonder, which comes out in October with Penguin Random House, yeah. and um, I'm on the Convergent imprint, which I'm super pumped about because I love everything they publish. So I'm like, can't believe I get to be part of this group. It's been the single biggest honor of my life so far. Um, and it's a book about, you know, transmuting um, what is often sort of maligned as a negative thing in religious culture, which is doubt, uh, into its, what I think the, the potential of it is, which is a wonder, it's the curiosity, playful spirituality, uh, how to be a spiritual person in the wake of the loss of belief. Because a lot of people don't know what they believe and may never know, and yet they want to experience the world spiritually. So how do you do that? So that's what I'm writing about. And it's a lot of my own story and um, the things I have learned. 
And then I am also launching this community called Doubt Becomes Wonder, which will involve several tiers of engagement, you know, from group to -to one-to-one coaching options. Um, I'll be launching the website for that in the new year, which I imagine is when this will be airing anyway. And um, the other thing is that I have a podcast called Archetypical with a Jungian analyst named Tony Caldwell, in which we explore ourselves through uh, the archetypal figures and themes in pop culture and story and religion. So our first two episodes were about Christ, our second two are about Antichrist, and then we are moving on to everything from Medusa to Bob Dylan to androgynous pop culture figures. Just everything Mm. and anything that kind of lends us an opportunity to gain a perspective on ourselves via Mm. these pieces of uh, story that archetypes provide. So that is, that's what I'm up to. And then I also make music for a living. So you can find me on Spotify and Apple Music and all the places. And I'm, I assume that people can go to your website, uh, which mm-hmm. is assuming is AudreyAsad.com. It is. And learn yeah. about all these things that you're doing. And, and just to be, because I have to do this with my name, that's A-U-D-R-E-Y-A-S-S-A-D.com. <laughs> yes. yes. And uh, it's the curse of not being Bill Smith.com. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, you know, just that people can go there and learn all about this stuff. I can't commend your music uh, highly enough to, to people. Thank you. And um, I feel so good. You're my Christmas present. Oh, thanks, this, Ian. This year. It's so, and so good to see you. I know it was so good to see you. And uh, peace on earth to you, you and to all the people that you love. Thank and you. Uh, Anthony. Let's do it. May you have love. May you have joy. May you have peace, may you have healing, and may you have rest. Until next time.